I'm Aubrey, and welcome back to Sailing Miss Lone Star. This is my pirate ship, and her name is Houdini. She's a 1977 Formosa 51. All right, the hardest part about living on a boat is finding space. And when we find it, we stuff it full of things. So, with all of these nooks and crannies, I have found that the best way to live on a boat is every six months to get in to a cabinet, if not all the cabinets, and see what you've touched and haven't touched. If you haven't touched it and it's not a boat part, she got to go. So today I'm gonna to work on the stairs that you guys are sitting on right now. And I'm gonna pull everything out and see what exactly is in there because I actually couldn't tell you exactly. Garlic. I don't know if all this is good still. This is food saver stuff, but my food saver broke. So, should I get a new food saver? Or should I get rid of the bags? I think food saver is kind of important on a boat, so I'm gonna hold on to these. I have two giant jars of coconut that maybe I can decant into one because that's a little unnecessary. I'm kind of looking at these stairs as prime real estate. Maybe not the bottom, but definitely the top three. storage and this is a ton of stuff I don't really use that much all right so I'm gonna try to decant these put one into the other this is most certainly going to be a huge mess so I think I'm gonna use a combination between a spatula and a spoon now let's see which one has more oh boy Smells good though. For those of you who are wondering, coconut oil begins to liquefy at 75 degrees. So, I would like to stay in the areas that the coconut is liquid, <laughs> above 75 degrees. So that's gonna be my barometer for my travels. Is this liquid? If it is not liquid, it is time to go. This winch will be used for furling and for the sheet line for the stay sail. However, if you look at that feed line, it is going down. So I need to create a riser for this winch. And I have the T cut out from the nav station. And I'm going to cut two discs out of that. And that's going to raise this up by two inches. And I think that will be enough to make this a usable winch. So this is the cutout I was referring to. You can see it's an inch thick of teak. And I'm gonna use this and this guy. Mark out two rings and I'll still have some scrap teak for another project. So this is my little setup. I've got a jigsaw, 
I got it set that I'm gonna work nice and slow and got a fine tooth. This is gonna take a rather long time and make quite a bit of mess. So now you can see the angle to feed into this drum is almost horizontal for the sheet and for the furling lines it's perfect. So I'm going to screw these two blocks together and then take the orbital around the edge to make it uniform. So this is what it looks like after I've sanded it and rounded it as well as I could with an orbital sander. Now I'm going to take this winch apart and get the base separated so I can mark out the holes on this piece, drill it out, uh, then I can put this aside for varnish and I can, in between the coats of varnish, I can service this winch and have it ready so when everything's all done, put it down on the boat and it's ready to go. Now figure out what size probably start off with this and then work my way up to whatever size that is I'm assuming it's 5 16 that's uh, 3 8 yeah so definitely think it's a 5 16 yeah I'll drill these holes up to a 5 16 and then I'll get started with servicing and varnish. Final coats. Woohoo! Is it the final coat? The second coat. <laughs> so far from final coat. It's <laughs> third coat today already. Nice. Thinking Love this about. total boat. Thank you, total boat. You guys have been really taking care of us. All right. This is the lesser spotted Searle putting in the plate that he made as a riser for that winch that you guys can't see over there. So this lovely little number is going in so that we have something for the furling lines. So the furling lines are a bit small for the self-tailing winch, so we're gonna have to tail it with our hands, we think, um, for now until we can get a smaller winch. But we're gonna put the 44 on, which we have. It's a 44, isn't it? Isn't that what I saw? Yeah. Yeah. So, so many winches, so little time. Um, also, other news look how beautiful these turned out we're not going to install them right now we're going to wait till we get down south because there's just not time because stuff always comes up on a boat just times it by three when you're trying to figure out how long something's going to take you right look at that that looks nice how many coats did you do after i did um i think i did five today five okay cool So here's the 44 Lumar that we're going to service right now. We've got it apart and we're going to grease it up and then uh, go ahead and install it. Or I might have spoken too soon, it might not be in that order. <laughs> install then service. Okay, so Searle has added some butyl tape here and we're in an argument because I think that he shouldn't add it on the inside here because he's got it here as well and I think it's going to get caught in this gear. And do you know what, guys? We're not going to know if this is going to be a problem until much later. So now we have it videoed and you guys can help us remember when we go to turn this winch and it's no turny turny or it gets more difficult. So please vote. Please comment. Do you think that we're putting the butyl tape in the wrong spot? <laughs> right. The moment of truth. I can't see. Is that 
Does that look like some alignment there? I and uh, uh, shift it that way a little. Okay, good. Okay. Yep, a little bit more, tiny bit. Oh, there, there we it go. is. There it is. There it is. Okay. Cool. <laughs> Woohoo! That's good. all she wrote, folks. It's you can just use it now, just like that. Get the line strip on. So, what angle should we put the line stripper? Come on. Going to your new home. Why does it only want to go into that? So. There we have it, folks. She's done. She maybe shift one notch over. <laughs> Cheeto trying to find somewhere comfy. <laughs> that will do, donkey. That will oh do. Oh boy, he's my special. He's my special little man. So when we put the boom up, we realized that it wasn't gonna clear the back stays, so it needed to be shortened. Uh, but in the process of shortening it, the out hole, which is a steel cable, wasn't modified. So at the max out hole, pull out, you see, got about this much. So from the eye being here to there, you got just over a foot. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut this sheath off and I know there's a crimp, wire rope crimp underneath there and I'm going to reuse the th uh, thimble and I'm going to use two of these stainless steel wire clamps and clamp clamp but shorten this enough so this can be that the actual car that's in the boom can almost make it right to the back here. Yeah. Um, I think I'm gonna use an angle grinder. I'll take one of our wooden cutting boards and wedge it underneath here so there's no chance of causing any damage. So, only problem I foresee is that it's resting on the aluminum, which will eventually cause uh, galvanic corrosion. Um, other thing, these ends aren't the prettiest, so I'm gonna probably cut these off. It's metric, unfortunately, so to find an acorn that can go on there and make it look good uh, will be a little bit trickier. Uh, but otherwise, this as a temporary solution is gonna be perfectly fine. This is gonna get us down south or until we get somebody with a proper crimper and throw some heat shrink on there. So you won't have an issue. So a minor anchoring situation is when the anchor does eventually hit the ground, it slacks on the chain and it pulls into this corner where the chain is actually rubbing against the cap rail, thus uh, destroying whatever's finishes on there. Um, you know we've installed a bow roll on the very end and the previous system has a carrier bearing and a rod that goes across. Thinking about inverting that up onto the top to try bring this chain up a little bit and prevent it from smacking on here. Otherwise I do have a strip of stainless steel that's curved that I could put around the very edge here. So let me see. I'm going to try with the carrier bearing inverting the old rollers first and then if that doesn't work then I'll put that extra piece of stainless on the front here. Another small job ticked off. So this bow roller was previously mounted underneath. It has now been mounted on the top, secured, and the chain surprisingly stays in there even when it slacks up completely. This piece of, or oh, I don't even, eighth round, that has protected this whole section of wood from this banging and sliding down. Um, I can't really shape something into this space, but this is far better than what was going on here. 
and should get us by till we do a crazy redesign on this bowsprit and anchor roller. So what you're going to look for is over here, you can see where the new piece has been put in, how it's going to prevent the chain when it's slack, like it is right now, from bashing across the cap rail. You can see that there is previous damage there. And you'll see how this roller that's been inverted all plays a role. So. The main issue is when you're letting chain out. So if I press that. So I think the big thing is just to pay it out in a controlled manner. So I'm not holding it down. But even so, it's working perfectly. So those two fixes on the bowsprit for the roller is a great, quick, easy one. Get us down south before we start the real remodel of the bowsprit. But anyway, I call that great success. Okay, so the engine, we got two things that we look for. Uh, we just want to make sure that it's got good fuel pressure, it's got oil and the belt is in good condition and not trying to run away like last time. We also want to check on the transmission oil. So I'm just going to show you where to find those things and how to get to them. So the fuel leaves the filters, runs down along the side of the engine, goes into, in this bottom corner here, is a mechanical fuel pump and on the right hand side of it is a lever that you can depress down and that you can use to prime the engine if you're not going to use the Keenan filters to prime it. Then it comes up through here into these two secondary filters. Here you've got bleed screw for filter 1, bleed screw for filter 2. Then the fuel runs over to the mechanical fuel injection pump. Then you'll bleed this nut. Then you'll move to this nut. And by the time you've bled all those, then you can start cranking the engine. You do not want to crank the engine for a long period of time if you know that fuel is not getting in there because the fuel actually adds lubrication to the cylinder walls so you would put a lot of wear and tear on the engine for no reason. Here's a close up on that fuel pump and this is the lever. So you're going to grab that and you're just going to push that down. And that you can use while cracking the bleed nuts to prime the engine. Checking the oil is on the starboard side. It's this thing over here and it's quite hard to get out. There's a very fine line bef between full and minimum. So I like to try keep it in the center because the engine is at a heel. So filling it up to the full line would mean the engine is over full. When you want to fill up the oil, you've got your oil filler on top of the engine here. That is the little handle you have to pull on to check the transmission oil. So this is the transmission dipstick and it works like a bung. As you twist this end cap, the rubber expands to seal off that. So what you need to do is when you stick it in, you need to rotate it clockwise and then the rubber expands and it creates a good seal. Checking the coolant is quite easy. It just takes a little bit of force with this particular one. And you can see that's 
filled to the brim. It takes a bit of force, but it's got the double seal, so in case it does overheat, the coolant will then be forced into the reservoir tank versus just squirting all over the engine like previously. The important one, the belt for the Belmar and the water pump. So basically, if you see the charge completely stop on the ammeter, the, the meters by the helm, you know that that belt is broken off. The other thing also, you'll feel that there's a little bit of a power increase all of a sudden. That's how I felt it last time. And what you're going to need to do is shut down the engine as quick as possible. Because now there's no coolant cycling through the engine and you'll overheat and then you've got an anchor in a very short amount of time. So shut it down and hopefully you've got your sails or get ready to anchor, figure something out there. It is a quick procedure just to swing on another belt but you need to know where the tools are for the job. So now the belt has broken off and it's been sucked into some of the pulleys and now is making a horrible smoky rubber smell everywhere. The other issue if this belt does break up the strands, the hair like cotton strands inside the belt that gives it its strength will now be all over the bilge and fall down into the bilge sump area. So you need to make sure you can collect as much of that as possible to prevent a bilge clog issue. On the alternator itself, this is the only part that's going to be adjusting. The alternator slides in towards the rest and then they'll create enough slack to pull the belt off. To do that, you've got this nut here and this screw over here. What you're going to have to do is loosen this one with uh, an open face socket. You're going to have to loosen this one with an open face or an adjustable. And then you will twist this, twist this, twist this, and it will work this part along gradually. So you want to have a socket that goes on the end here. You can crank that. And then if you need to, then to also go with this to make it go as far to the side as possible to make putting the next belt on as easy as possible. And then remember you have to tension it all the way out. There is one spare belt ready to go. My biggest concern for the boat is just to make sure you do your engine checks as every 30 minutes until you really get into the groove of it then you can move to your one hour periods and I would not stretch more than two hours without doing an engine check. Remember you're going to put your fingers on the impeller housing make sure it's cold not that you can't hear it because it's quite aggressive out the back there. Uh, you want to make sure that the RPM is holding at a good rate make sure the fuel uh, tank that is supplying isn't going to run out of fuel. The quicker you get to a fuel tank running out and switching it over to the next, the better it is. Then you don't have to land up bleeding the system. So that's my little two cents. And the alternator belt, that is just going to have to be a problem for a while. I can turn down the belt tension. Uh, more so than I've already done and we can try get by but I think you might go through another belt or two on the way down. Uh, the easiest way to prevent that is just not loading up the engine too hard until the whole engine room is warm. When the engine room is all warm and the belt is warm then it will tolerate the the wonky main uh, rod so it won't feel the need to break so that's all i have to say about that did you know that i have over 1000 daily shows on vimeo everyone's gone so i'm having a good time do you have to spray them with eyeballs or can you like <laughs>
feel like you're the captain by sitting on that seat. I wake up feeling like I'm the captain. <laughs> we had a surprise thunderstorm. But, so much cheaper than a carrot. Ow! Again. We started. <laughs> Can I join the band? It has been so much fun getting to know you guys <laughs> and sharing this time with you behind the scenes. I love my daily show family so much. Back to your 